Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 162, for Monday, April 23rd, 2018. Thanks, folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the podcast that is by, for, and about working musicians. Sponsors for this episode include Tune Licensing, where at tunelicensing.com, coupon code GIGGAB2018 saves you 15% of the, off of their licensing fees. We'll talk about that uh, in a minute, a little bit more. Uh, but here, for now, right now, in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And out here in Las Gatas, California, it's Paul Kent. I'm finally getting some nice uh, weather out here, Paul. So, oh, good. You do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Spring finally figured out how to get here. So that was good. Yeah. Yeah. Good. How, how are you doing, man? Doing good. Um, I had just had another really good stretch of of, uh, of gigs and rehearsals. So I've been doing a lot of stuff. Yeah. And again, I'm just finding all these kind of cool things about my voice is like the, you know, the more I really focus on technique, it's just there for me. It's, you know, I've been able to go four or five nights in a row singing rock and roll and it's, it's good. So That's I'm good. just loving that, you know, like it's all discovery, right? We're all just trying to figure out how to use these instruments and, um, uh, and you're just learning a lot of things about tone, how to harness tone when your voice has a little bit of that rasp into it, that natural rasp, yep. as opposed to trying to manufacture that natural rasp. So it's um, it's pretty cool. Yeah. I got, I've just got a lot of music going on right now and it's all heading towards this, May 5th uh, Springsteen tribute show that I'm going to be doing. And the rehearsals for that have been going really good. We had one last night. And, you know, that's just, you know, we, you and I haven't ever spoken about that stuff. It's just different music. You know, it's, it's a lot of piano based stuff. Oh, yeah. The grooves are different. The, Spring, the feel of it. music is weird. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. Like, like in that it doesn't really fit. Like if you're a, a dance band, like, like we had an Uptown Celebration rehearsal yesterday uh, that also turned into or was built as a rehearsal. And then uh, a, a, a couple who's getting married and were playing their wedding in the summer uh, and their parents, respective parents, came over and, and you know, wanted to check out the band and all that stuff. Um, so we, you know, we did uh, we rehearsed some and actually worked on a couple of new tunes. It was really nice. We had um, it was our first real band rehearsal where. I felt like everybody was at the same place as opposed to last year when we were rehearsing. It was just like you're catching Dave, up. All get the time. Dave up to speed. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So so that part was nice. But one of the tunes that this band plays is Born to Run. And, <laughs> it, you know, when you look at a list of songs that has, you, you know, like like uh, Uptown Funk in September and, and all of that stuff and Born to Run on that list, it's like, oh, yeah, these are all popular songs that people know. Right. But man, like that's a weird, it, it's not a dance song, right? It's, it's not a groove tune, even though, I mean, it's got lots of different grooves in it, but it's not just a tune that has one groove that goes all the way through or anything. Um, it, it's, it's, a, it's its own thing. Um, and, and it's hard to place in a cover music. band dance show. It, you know, I think his stuff, you know, pretty much dance in the dark and glory days are about the best you can do for, you know, known 10th, 10th Avenue Freeze Out's a perfect one. That's a good one. It's yeah. got a nice bounce to it's it. Got yeah. a nice, exactly. But I agree, you know, yeah. yep. Thunder Road, you know, Born to Run, Prove It All Night. You know, these are they're anthemic songs that are cool songs if you like to play them and if you can if you can, you know, kind of represent them in a the right way. Sure. But the instrumentation is interesting and it's different and the sound yeah. is different. You the know, it's sound just not is different. That's yeah. It's not eighties, you know, it's not hair band power no. chord stuff. It's no. it's it's more like it's more like harder edged birds stuff, you know, it's like really, you know, arpeggiated guitar yeah. feels, but, and overdriven, but not distorted guitars. And they're just different types of groove. And yeah, the, the whole got, discussion, it's got, about, an, it's got an edge to it. Right. Cause I mean, yeah. like we were playing, uh, we actually learned, uh, your love from the outfield yesterday, which, which went really well. And, and, cool and tune. it's a great tune. Yeah. 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 The harmonies are really fun and, and all that stuff. And then, you know, we also play like living on a prayer, but, but like 
those three songs, Born to Run and, and Your Love and Living on a Prayer, completely different songs. Right? I mean, yeah. it's like, again, you look at them on a list. You're like, oh, those are cool. Those are good rock songs. Like, yeah, but don't try to play like the wrong one when people are up and moving. You got to wait till people have had enough to drink and they just want to like, you know, throw the horns in the air and rock out for a song. And then you're good to go. Well, you know, here, here's the deal. Yeah, it, that's the deal with Born to Run is like if you go see Springsteen play Born to Run, the way that band plays it. The, the people dance to it. I mean, people move to it, right? People, people are engrossed. Yes. People are engrossed in it. And, but it's a delicate thing to get right. If it's too heavy, it, it just doesn't sound right. Yep. And if it's too wimpy, it definitely doesn't sound right. So there, you know, that like many Springsteen things, there's a, there's a very particular middle ground of how the rhythm, the groove goes and how the rhythm section brings it alive. And that's actually been one of the cool things about working with this band is like, except for, Joe, my drummer, who's a big Springsteen fan. Right. And Mike, my sax player, who's a big Clarence Clemens fan. All the guys who agreed to do this for me are kind of new to this music and they've been discovering it and kind of hearing how where they first start with their interpretation of what they think they heard to when we start putting the songs together is a, been a really interesting process. And again, these are great musicians and really good guys and are really open to it. And it's kind of fun for me. You know, like when we play something for the first time and it's just not right. And then I start tweaking and giving suggestions for some things and showing what parts of the riff are important to focus on and, you know, how some of these kind of loose time things, you know, get tied together. And then seeing it, the songs come together and the light bulbs go on for them. That's actually been a very, very rewarding part of this. It's like, this is music I know and is inside of me, you know, really and deeply uh, and getting other people to the place where the feel of it, because it, it's just... Like we, we kid a lot about honky tonk woman. Like you could do almost anything to that song and people will f find it and enjoy it. And you know, those types of things. But most of the time Way you're just ruining it. Uh, well, but, even, but, even but people, people will like it, enjoying really it, distorted guitars, you yeah. know, and, and, but, but this music is a little bit different and it's not the only music that's well, like that. So, I mean, so let me ask you this because if this music is really different is what you just said, but what I, what I think is a little more accurate is that this music is different to you. Right. And, and I mean, like we all have our our sacred cows, right? The, the, the bands and songs that sure. matter to us and all that stuff. And I've always like there. It's difficult. It can be difficult. It's not definitively dif difficult, but it can be difficult playing. Being in a band, playing songs that matter to you in a you know, with with people that, to whom they don't have that same significance where it's like, Oh yeah, well I just play the, the, you know, the chords as they're written and, and I've heard it on the radio. And so like, we're good to go. Uh, and so I, like, I was curious as you started heading down the path of, of the Springsteen thing, was that, was that going to result in frustration for you or was it going to result in like, like you're describing joy where you've got these people that, that get it, enough on their own and then are open to this, like, you know, it can be tweaked. And I, and I guess, I guess perhaps you set yourself up for success here because you, I mean, you're billing this as a Springsteen night. So there is some expectation that these songs should be played the way, the, the, not the way Springsteen would play them, but, but with a nod to that, as opposed mm -hmm. to, you know, you're just bringing a Springsteen song into a general cover band and it's like, yeah, look, we play songs the way we play them. And, you know, we get the the right pieces here and there so that people recognize it. And that's that's the metric. Right. Or that's the bar to hit. So I love I love this question. So so here's here's the thought. Now, obviously, I don't sound like Springsteen. Few singers do. Sure, I don't yeah. I don't sound you know that way. And so it wouldn't have been right for me to say that it's like a tribute band approach to it. Right. And but that's I why I know steered they, away from that that word. But yeah. Yep. Yep. But I do know the important parts. And I've you know listened to this music for so long and seen them live so many times. I think for the person who's a Springsteen fan, I connect with those things that are the special things that, you know, make the music come to life. And so, you know, our arrangements, um, uh, I, I sent out good definitive live versions as the basis for us to learn the songs from. Um, I referred back to original recordings when there are kind of fundamental, you know, parts that you got to add back in and make sure are, are played. Yeah. Um, the song selection I think is pretty representative, but again, I don't sound like them. But I, 
I'm satisfied that where we're, where we're ending up with is a an enjoyable night of a presentation of Springsteen music, not not attempted to be done in a tribute format, like yeah. done well. I mean, like so I I picked a you know a really good piano player, and that's key to this music. Yes. Um, but I picked really good guys. You know, some of them were guys who had said to me, "Hey, I'd love to do a project with you sometime." Um, some of them were just guys I knew are just good listeners and good team players and were willing to let me lead on this. And um, I guess that's that, the key is embracing the, the embracing that, that, that it's someone's a, a vision, I guess. Right. And you, that, you could vision, apply that to right. anything. Yeah. 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 So you, you know, you got to pick the people, right. But you know, here's a good example. And there, and again, this is not the only music that's like that. You couldn't take doctor my eyes and, and make it a, you know, too heavy a song, right? I mean, there, I don't know. I think Metallica certain... could actually do a great version of that, but 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 <laughs> but maybe, right? You're impossible, dude. <laughs> <laughs> think about think about what they did to Baker Street, right? Like that's nah. a, a mellow tune, like that. I would hit before. Well, I'll, I'll, here's how I'll challenge version, you, right? Here's the deal: Metallica can. Metallica are yeah. masters at at taking songs and putting it into their genre. Right. I would say the the. Average to typical to even very good cover band, even the very creative cover band. It's hard to do. Some some songs, you know, are hard to change stylistically and still get across what's great about the song. Yeah. And I think I think along kind of pulling on that thread for a minute, I think that th the reason Metallica can do that and the reason some other bands can do that, too, is they know who they are, who they are, right. Yeah. They, they know that when, when we Metallica, not, not, not me, but when we <laughs> play a song, we are going to sound like Metallica, right? Even if we tried to play Baker street, just the same way Rafferty did, right? Like it's gonna, like, even if we try to get their guitar tones and all of that stuff, it it's still uh, like, it's still the same Peep musicians playing this, we're going to sound like we sound. So they've learned not only to embrace that, but they know what that Perfected. they know what they're embracing. They're they're yeah. like eyes wide open, I think, with that kind of stuff. And that's that's where, um, but like to me, a lot of these these things can fall apart. Is a band that wants to sound, or even more frustrating, one person that wants a band to sound different then that band is capable of sounding or yeah. that that band would naturally sound right. It, it, you know, and that's, that's a really like that. That's a, that's a tough thing in a lot of bands and with a lot of, it people, just creates a lot of frustration. Right. Frust and that's, that's the thing about getting everybody on the same page. I yeah. agree with you. Metallica is Metallica because they know who they are and they know how to do what they do. Right. Yeah. That, that sound that is that sound you asso associate with Metallica is an endemic, part of the chemistry of those guys and put something in their hands and something sounding like, you know, that vibe is just going to happen. You know, even if they want to stretch out and, you know, find some different things, elements of, of what you love about Metallica and them putting their stamp on something else. Yes, that can happen. But you're right. The flip side of that is all too often in bands where it's, you know, a professional association of, of artists coming together on the weekend to play cover music and make some money where the styles are not truly the same. Like those, like bands can be very successful copying what's on a record, but once it gets into the creative expression, that's a different road. Sometimes it can yield some pretty amazing things. You can find your way to something and that's kind of fun in that the creativity of making music with people can be expressed that way. But often it just, it just, it results in frustration because that thing you have in your head is not the thing that the other guys have in their head. And, you know, your ability to kind of get the other guys either to where you are or to harness the talents, leverage the talent of the people you play with to get yep. to something interesting. That's that's kind of the, the trick there. All right. So did I make it up that Metallica covered Baker Street? I would swear that I've heard them play that tune. But uh, let's look it up. I, well, that's what I've been doing here to put it into the show notes so that people could hear a link and uh, or hear hear this version. And I swear they did this and, and I cannot find it uh, in, you know, the, the 30 seconds of half searching that I was able to do while we're talking here. But uh, I, I know the Foo Fighters have done a, a version of Baker Street, but I would have sworn that back 
in I would say the late nineties, ninety eight, ninety nine. Oh, it's Foo Fighters is is the is what comes up in the search. I know, but but I, I would say in the late nineties there was a version of of Baker Street that I I swear Metallica did. But anyway, the the point stands even if I've got the song <laughs> wrong. Foo Fighters would be a great example. That like it, yeah, Foo Fighters have a style. Of, they have a sound. They have a a vibe to the music that they create. They do. If they put their hands around something. Yeah, that's going to happen. It's going to happen. Right. They always sound like the Foo Fighters. A lot of times it sounds like the Foo Fighters just messing around and joking and playing a cover. Um, they, like they don't necessarily always work to perfect their their version of it. Uh, but. But they definitely know who they are. Yeah. Yeah. And and maybe that's why sometimes it's just like, no, we'll just fake our way through it. And like, that's who we are. So yeah. there you go. Yeah. I, um, hey, go ahead. Ahead. No, I was going to say I had, um, I had a, uh, a madhouse gig this week and for the first time in, in many madhouses and probably in six months, we played a good chunk of the show with tracks and I had forgotten how different that is um and in a sense it's actually very comforting because some of these songs uh are are not songs where i just internally know the tempo you know what i mean and uh mm -hmm. and and so trying to get that tempo on stage in the middle of everything else that's going on uh, can be you know i mean sometimes you just get it wrong whereas with the tracks man you're just like that the tempo is the tempo and it it's it's mm -hmm. quite freeing in that regard and and so it was it was interesting when they when they first said oh yeah you know probably half the tunes that you're playing are going to be tracked i thought oh no not that again but um but as we got through rehearsals and and especially when we got to the performance it was like oh this is actually great uh, <laughs> cuz it i mean not only does it, it keep the, the the you know let the tempo be where exactly where um it's expected but also we then have the ability to trigger other, you know, sounds and events as, as that happened through the the songs that we couldn't otherwise do. With and what's the thinking behind why you decided to 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 use tracks? Um, it, a lot of it, it. Well, it's always sounds. Right. So it's can we um, can 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 we as as a in this in this particular particular case, it was a four piece band. Uh, can this band replicate enough of the sounds to give this performance what it needs to sound like. So like one of the tunes that we used to track on, I'm pretty sure we used to track on it. Um, I can't remember was uh, Cindy Lauper's girls just want to have fun. Right. And so there's that very uh, recognizable keyboard patch there that, that kind of plays not only plays like the stabs through it, but is also playing a sequenced part all the way through the song. And, yep. you know, and so without that, that starts to get a little, it, it's just missing. Now, I mean, it, it, a band can play it obviously without that, but it was like, well, there's no reason, there's no reason not to have that. They've got a good sounding track. Okay, great. We'll just, you know, we'll just play along with the sequencer. That's it's no problem, you know? And, um, so, so that's, so that's this is it. interesting it to sounds. Me. Yeah. Uh, what's interesting to me is that I've always thought I'm surprised that you use tracks because I, I always see you as kind of more purist. And when I have this conversation with musicians, it's like the only thing that should be, you know, it's not good that so much of today's music is not being created in in real time as you see it. Yeah. And so I'm I'm you're actually kind of taking me by surprise. So do you have you never had a problem with you? Like it's always a viable option because it's just a sound. Yeah, I mean, think about like if you're and this particular Madhouse was full of of 80s tunes. Right. And there's so many of those where their sequencers just driving all the way through this thing. Sure. And and so to me, like that music is sequenced, uh, but it's how it is. I mean, and you could just have a drum machine play along with it and just track the whole thing. But but having the hybrid of of having a band play and then having the sequencer do the things that the sequencer can do um, can work out really well. Or in the case of a tune that needs, you know, like horn stabs or whatever, and you don't have a horn section, it's like, all right, well, let's just sequence the horns and then, you know, and then they're there. And and, and you know, Madhouse, I guess it's a little bit different with Madhouse than it would be, say, for a fling gig, uh, although I wouldn't necessarily be against it. From a sequencer standpoint, I wouldn't be against it at a fling gig. For triggering horns, I would. Uh, because there, the only thing you have to watch is the band, 
Right. And and so, you know, you're watching Fling and suddenly these horn parts come out of nowhere and you're like, well, that's sort of weird. Um, you know, those they're supposed to sound like a trumpet and a trombone and there's none of those things on stage. <laughs> uh, right. But with Madhouse, it's um, it, kind of like in a in a sense, like Cirque du Soleil, where it's totally like ADD fueled. There's a million things to watch at any given point in time mm. happening on stage and also happening. You know, I mean, there's a and there's also a band playing. Right. So, um, I, I mean, there was one video I posted today of us playing. Uh, oh, what song was it? Oh, I Will Survive. And I and that one actually was not tracked. We didn't we didn't track anything from there. We didn't need it. But even just watching that video, you get a four piece band playing. You get this woman singing and dancing, uh, you know, singing this song and dancing to it. A couple of other dancers with her doing this this choreographed routine. And then oh, all, also, yeah, by the way, there's someone literally hanging from the ceiling, spinning around on silks and doing a routine there. Right. So mm. there's like all kinds of stuff happening. So to have horns come in out of no, I mean, we didn't do it on that song, but but in, generally speaking, to have horns come in out of nowhere, like you're it, unless you're really paying attention and looking for those things that might not be created live in the moment, you're not necessarily going to realize that, oh, that was sequenced unless it sounds like crap. And we don't, you know, we, we tend to only use good sounding sequences and, 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 and you know, <laughs> samples and things like that. So, yeah. And, and I, I like the challenge of playing with a click live. I mean, as much as it is comforting, it's also a challenge. Like if the band starts to try, you know, try and drive the tune or something, well, uh, you know, that can't happen, right? It's got to stay where the click is. And Do you rehearse to these, to these clicks? Yeah. And to the, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, you know, once, but yes. Yeah. We get, we get to go through it once. So, yeah, but it's good. I mean, you got to have a sense of playing in time. And I, I grew up playing on a metronome, so I don't know what that would be like if I didn't. Um, but, you know, you got to be able to play in time anyway, I think. So, yep. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So interesting. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah, good. All right. So I have an interesting topic to bring up with you. And I was thinking about this because I saw quite a bit of live music, you know, over the last couple of weeks. And I was thinking about revisiting the whole concept of uh, performance 101. Okay. I like it. Performance 101. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just kind of tips, you know, what to do, what not to do, and uh, things that uh, will help people connect with their audiences. So just to start this conversation, you know, I, I I feel the essence of performance is this concept of truth. Are you emoting truthfully who you are? Now, there's a rub there in that if truthfully who you are is when you play music, you go very far inward and are not conscious of your audience. You're just really performing for yourself. That's going to create a problem often. Right. Awesome. So well, you need to so, solve that. You, you need to be aware of that and solve for it. In, in right. one of a variety of ways. That's right. Yeah. So I'm going to let's just hold that up in the air as kind of a caveat as we kind of go through these things about yeah. about. And again, you know, I, I would say this is largely directed towards dance cover band type, you know, promoters, pre, pre, performers. But, um, you know, I think it's applicable in many, many places. You know, there may be places where you're a jazz band and you're sitting in the corner and it's not really about you. You're just kind of like, you know, music and, you, you know, people can just absorb your vibe. Paper. Yeah. In that yeah. Or, or, you know, I guess, you know, jazz is kind of a unique um, venue. I mean, I think to take a little side chip, if all the members of a jazz trio are inward and nobody is really focused on the performance, I would say you'd, you'd better be pretty darn good if you're going to hold on to an audience. But if there's a leader of a trio and the ex, you know, whatever yeah. instrument might be. And he's the one who's really doing the connecting and your job as, as a side man is, you know, not, there's not as much heavy lifting on your shoulders to connect with the audience and you can disappear into your own vibe. That's cool. But I mean, you got to kind of know the game I, you're playing. Yeah. I would even argue there. I mean, cause I've played plenty of gigs as a side man, some jazz gigs, some rock gigs or whatever. And certainly, you know, even, even in a band like fling, right. Where it's, you know, as much my band as it is anybody else's now, um, there there are times where I should not be drawing attention to myself like that should go to somebody else. And there are times absolutely where I should be drawing attention to myself. And that's that's what should happen. But and that's true when you're a sideman, too. I mean, if the leader throws you a solo, 
Well, by all means, you, you got to like it now. The spotlight quite literally is yours. Right. So, it, you know, here's the interesting thing about that. <clears throat> I. Solos are different. I, I don't know that I can think of someone who takes a solo, who's an accomplished musician, who doesn't look engaged. The uh, very, the very process of creating a solo it extracts a certain truth from you, you know, in order to, you know, find that imp those improvised thoughts. I actually find that I, I, I'm thinking about people. I see even some of the worst performing bands I have when the spotlight is on you. There's an innate thing that as you dig into your soul, trying to find the right notes to play, yeah. um, that you are performing and there's a certain truth that comes out to that. And I think that's a really good thing. So I, um, I, I will I will uh, disagree there only because I've I've seen it. I've both been on stage with it and I've been in, in the audience with it where someone's taking a solo and playing just fine. And literally not doing anything that would be interesting to watch, let alone connecting with the audience is the it room. lifeless if they're pl yeah. is playing just fine is it lifeless uh no like the like like musically the the solo's great i mean i've been a, in a thing where i've been playing along with somebody who's you know soloing keyboard player guitar player and like really grooving along with it and playing and then you know like maybe i'll get into my own playing for a little bit and i look up like i want to see like how this is translating or whatever mm -hmm. i want to connect with this person and they're totally like just dish rag, right? No, <sighs> no emotion. And and so I don't think it's innate to everyone, but I also think there's a flip side to it that when you're playing a solo, you almost need to perform that solo in, in a sense, Russ, Russ put it a good way. A number of years ago, as we were having this conversation in, in a fling rehearsal, he said, Make it look harder than it is. Like, you know, when you're when you're holding it, like if you're a guitar player, you know, if you're holding the note, make it look like you're holding that note. Because really, all you got to do is hold your finger on the string. That's it. <laughs> right. I mean, like, like this is how the, the mechanically this is how this works. But, you know, like shake that thing, make it, you know, make somebody feel like you're really like squeezing this sound out of your instrument. And eventually that does become sort of a natural process of of playing a solo once you you know once you kind of embrace that but um but that's not how it always is you know you can be very schroeder like and and still play your ass off but but not necessarily communicate that to anyone you hmm. know what i mean well let's try this so so um and i realize we're totally off on a tangent here but i think this is an important one I, th I agree. So, so if you're that guy, you know, you said Schroeder, like, so here's the deal. Um, Schroeder is kind of freaking cool. He kind of has his own vibe. That is his truth. And, yep. and, and people react to it. The question is, do people look at you and get your vibe, your truth, or do mm -hmm. people see you as a dish rag? And if people see you as a dish rag, your, your, um, your life as a performing musician probably could use some, it's introspection enhancement yes yeah yeah right yeah, some so maybe that's some, the thing is some, you know yeah for sure you know do, do you have people who can give you an honest assessment of how you're coming across on stage because again it's a you know this is a thing you know performing is a thing yeah. and i again start with a when i go absorb live music um you know i'm looking for is a truth being communicated to me that's I think, first i think what you're saying here is always be performing <laughs> that's true we should burn a t-shirt with that <laughs> we should yeah. that'd be a great idea so you know we start with the truth and you know is there some genuine emotion through music being communicated to me um and you know there's a technical acuity to part there's a visual acuity to that and i, I think both have to be understood and if either are not uh, it's very powerful when both are being delivered, but if either is not being delivered, can you, can you self-assess? And if you can't self-assess and you know, I would think most people know, you know, most people, even if you're a very uncomfortable live performer, regardless of your skill level, <clears throat> you probably have some sense that the energy isn't flowing quite right between you and the audience, right? I, Are you I, getting the feedback that you want, yeah. you know, when you play a passage, that type of thing. So, well, and if, and you, if not, and if do you, you have someone you trust? Yeah. And if you don't have that sense, work to develop it, right? Like, yeah. I, like I find it's so valuable to um, listen back or, or watch back 
performances. Now, it, you know, like with Madhouse, there are people there that take videos all night long. And so by the time I get home, <clears throat> I could go and watch most of the show. Right. Right. Sure. At that moment. I found that that's really bad timing for me because I have my own thoughts and feelings about how things went and all that stuff. And I don't necessarily need or want reality to influence that in that very tender, uh, you know, malleable moment. I, I need I like for me. It it does not work well for me to go and watch something back immediately after I've just performed it for a, a group of people. I need a few days at least. But after whatever period of time that is, and I can detach from it, like my my memory of whatever it is is already cemented. I'm comfortable with how it felt to me. Now I want to have that perspective. I <laughs> want it right now that I'm OK, I'm comfortable. It either is sucked then it was awful. And now I can watch it knowing it was off or wow, that was great. I wonder if the grit, that greatness translated out, you know, over there, or was it only great right here? You know, that kind of thing. And watching back, you, you know, you get that honest feedback, but you, you know, you have to be ready for it. And, and because otherwise it, it like, for, I can only speak for myself, but if I'm not ready for it, um, it, it it can really mess with me. So, yeah. Just, yeah. But after a couple of days, it's, you know, it's really good for me to go back. So I'll amplify that. So yeah. I, I, I definitely am in the habit of coming home from a gig. And, you know, if there are you know 20 posts of videos of, you know, from a gig, yeah. I've gotten in the habit of having to watch it that night. One, oh. to see if there's one to see if there's anything really good that I can use to promote the next thing mm -hmm. Two, if there's anything really bad that I got to figure out, you know, if, is it, is it bad that I want to ask the person to take it down? Is it, you know, is it, you know, yeah. so, so there's a little bit of like, you know, did they catch that clam type of thing? Um, but I will agree with you wholeheartedly that it sounds much different after your little, little space and go back yeah. and listen to it two, three days later. Yeah. There's a lot more to be learned at that time. So I'm kind of more in scouring mode, you know, right after a gig, but I'm, then I'm more in learning mode, you know, two or three days later. So I, I agree with you there. So I was thinking that, um, if we could come up with a, a brief list, a, a brief cheat sheet of performance tips, that would be helpful. I know it would help me and I hopefully will help somebody else out there. Number one on this, I think the simplest thing to do to get yourself into a performance vibe is smile. You know, just communicate that you are happy to be where you are, that, you know, that you are looking forward and enjoying the prospect of creating music for people. And that it's, it's really a powerful thing. That, that's Some a, people, no, it's, a, it's a great place to start because for me, when I'm, you know, if I'm distracted by whatever, like there's a million things that can happen when you're on stage. Right. And, and rem remembering, Hey, smile, it, it like that to me opens the door and it's like, oh, right. There's all these other things you're supposed to be doing yes. right now. Don't worry about that. Yep. Smile. There's people there. Cool. Great. Opens you know. the door. Good, yep. good way to put it. it. It kind of gets you in performance mode. It's it's the, the foundational thing that you're doing. Like, just yep. remember. And, and what are you doing when you're smiling? One is you're communicating joy, which is a really good, powerful thing when you're when you're performing. Yeah. But like you said, it also. If your brain goes to something simple like that, it then can go to the, all the other things that you may have to be thinking about in order to be a successful performer. So we start with smile. And then I think, you know, not too far down the line from that, a real simple thing to do is uh, and we can put a whole bunch of things under this category, but be engaged on stage. I, I like it when bands interact with each other. Be focused on encourage your bandmates, acknowledge great solos, you know, j just be engaged in the process of your team making this music together, however that might be. I, you've often referred to a look when something magical happens on stage between two musicians. I think audiences catch all those things. Yes. And so just just making that uh, connection with your team on stage, I think is a huge um, and easy to do second step as a performer. It's part of the, and it's part of the performance, right? Yeah. True. Yeah. But, but like you said, you're, you know, mostly communicating truth, right? But it can also be between songs. Like if there's someone that's talking with the crowd, you can have two people talk to each other on stage. Now, you don't want to get too insular, but it's almost when you're watching a band where two members start communicating on mic in, you know, to each other, 
you almost feel like the door's been open and you've been invited mm-hmm. in. Fourth wall. Yeah. yeah. It's like, oh, cool. Like, uh, this is, they're not just this thing that's, you know, barraging me with sound. These are people and, and they, they're they having fun. They're cutting up together. Now, obviously, you, you've got to watch the, the subject uh, and tone of those back and forth conversations. They should be with the intention of entertaining those people over there as opposed to, you know, hey, man, you really screwed that up. You know, although that delivered... In, in the most c- careful way can can be entertaining, but I wouldn't advise you to start there. Get to know yourself and your bandmates and how you interact before you ever even like acknowledge a clam on the microphone. Uh, well, you never acknowledge a clam and I don't think you ever, you'd never telegraph a clam yours or somebody else's. You definitely right. want to show up a bandmate. So, yeah. and I think that's a, that's just part of being a professional. And I, I never understand when people do that, when people, you know, roll their eyes or, you know, it almost is saying like, you know, um, it, 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 it reflects a bit of ego. Like I'm better than this and I shouldn't have made a clam or, or uh, that's that guy's problem. Not my problem. It definitely telegraphs a lack of teamwork. So yeah. there's just no need well, to, I, I mean, I, like, I guess I, a total train wreck. If you can, if you can cleverly make it a, a you know, like, Oh, you know, we're going to have to go back and practice that one or something, you know, something maybe, but yeah. the subtle things that 90% of the room are always missing. Your discomfort does not matter in the, in the big schemes things. Well, that's it. I've always felt like if you're going to telegraph a clam and, and I've sort of trained myself that anytime there is a clam that my, my gut reaction is not an outwardly negative one, even though internally I might be thinking, Oh crap. Right. You know, it always turns into kind of like a knowing smile, like, oh, hey, cool. Like we have to solve a problem together now. So that way, if anybody happens to catch it, it's it's whoa, these guys are enjoying whatever's going on right now. It's possible, perhaps likely the audience doesn't even know that you've made a mistake or that there's a problem. So it's that knowing glance. And then people want to feel like they know what that glance was about. Right. And and so it can be a positive thing, but you don't like if, if somebody just plays a wrong note or whatever, you don't want to shine a light on it and stop the song. Or, yeah, I mean, it's just there's 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 so many ways that can go wrong. You might think it's going to be entertaining, but like it, it rarely are you right about that. Never yeah, show any up anybody else. And never show yeah. up anybody else. Yeah, it's yeah, it's just not. It's not entertaining. It 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 sours the the audience for for one. I mean, there's it a million does. other reasons not. It to It creates do a tension. It creates yeah. an uncomfort, awkward feeling. Yeah. Springsteen has one of the greatest quotes about performing live, and he talks about his band this way. And he says, "We always approach it as what we're doing is the most important thing in the world, and at the same time, the most frivolous thing in the world." Yeah. You're you're playing your heart out. You're doing everything you can to communicate, but it's only rock and roll, and but they yeah. like it. You're on stage doing play pretend. I mean, it's like it does, you know, it's, it's like and that's but that's OK. Like, that's the point. This is supposed to be frivolous. This is supposed to be a departure from, you know, from whatever else you've got going on in life. So that's the point. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I say the third the third tip that I would want to offer is like we, we talk a little bit about introspection. So <clears throat> I told you I've seen bands where. Uh, you know, guys in their forties and fifties and the lead singer comes out in leather chaps and a leather vest and no shirt. And the other guys look like just, they just got out of engineering class, you know, with, with, <laughs> and the, the match wasn't right. And, yeah. and therefore the vibe was just kind of odd. And so it looked like the one guy who actually was a very good singer was just taking himself too seriously. And you, uh, you have to find that, um, comfortable vibe. This goes in a, in a lot of ways. I, I often see a lot of people who are uncomfortable, um, performers, um, try to do the we're wild and crazy musicians thing just too much, like too silly um, to overcompensate for a lack of comfort with performing. Yep. Now, the the silly can work if that's your truth, like well, if that's if your that, shtick. And, and also if that fits in the it, it, it doesn't need to just be your shtick or truth or whatever it is. But it also needs to fit in the context of the rest of the band, essentially. Like yes. It, you There's know. a band out here called the Spasmatics. So they dress up, you know, like yeah. nerds and that type of thing. Yeah. And their whole vibe is this whole, you know, nerd spaz thing. And that's their that's their performance. Right. Absence being a costume band. You know, again, if you're not 
if you're not smooth, and again, you can learn these things, you know, that that's the deal. The more you do it, the yeah. better you get, um, you know, finding a way to rap with, with the, your audience. If you're a lead you know, person, or, you know, if your band, if your va- band vibe is anybody, you know, who has a mic, you know, can kind of t- address the audience or, or, you know, what is your rule in your band for that type of stuff? Right. You know, are you, is, does the leader have a real strict, you know, feeling about this that, you know, I want to keep a tight control about how we address the audience, but whatever it is, um, again, I go back to that concept of truth. So, uh, that forced overly silly musician thing is hard. The forced overly artsy. I'm a very serious musician thing is also hard. Yeah. You better have your playing back that up. Right. Yeah. And I think a lot of people, a lot of guys and, and, you know, certainly that, that kind of, you know, middle-aged, you know, dad rock kind of thing that goes on. There's a lot of people that just aren't comfortable doing something different on stage. So you wind up with a bunch of guys that look like they just finished mowing the lawn or, you know, uh, finished mowing the lawn and changed from their ratty grease grass covered t-shirt into a tie dye t-shirt. Right. And, and that can work. But I, I think the most important thing to realize is that whatever you choose to wear on stage is a, a choice and B is also your costume. Like yeah. that, that is you, you have put an outfit on intentionally or otherwise, right? Like if your vibe for your band is to look like the guys that just finished mowing the lawn and then go on stage and freaking kill it. Right. Like, okay, fine. Like you, but do that and be aware that that is the vibe you are embracing as opposed to sort of. Uh, you know, the ostrich syndrome of uh, I'm not comfortable thinking about what I'm going to wear. So I'm just not going to think about it. No, no. You better think about it because everybody else in the room is going to think about it, whether you want them to or not. Performing is a visual art. Otherwise, buy a record and listen to a record. So if you're going to go right. watch a band, listen to a band, see a band, see a band, you're seeing a band. And I agree with you. You know, it is a choice and it's a costume and it's um, and it's an important thing. I, I would say that we could probably connect all these things. Try this on, not to get overly business-like about this, but isn't it a, a productive conversation for your band to have where you figure out what is your mission? What is your mission statement? What mm-hmm. does everybody buy into? And does every, you know, in a business you would do this and then every decision you make needs to support that mission. So in your band, you can talk about this. Are, you know, are, is your mission, we're just three guys off the street who just want to demonstrate blue collar, you know, we're going for it every night is your thing is your mission. Like we want to create a special environment for people. And that, you know, like you played in a band that wore suits, right. Yeah, and ties. Totally. Yeah. 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 And what, yeah, and yeah. what was, how did that go when the leader, when, when you joined that band, did you start that band or join that band? No, I joined it. So it was already, a, it was already a thing. Uh, and you knew that was good, what was going to be yeah, expected. Yeah. Did anybody ever push back on it and say, dude, it's hot. It's hot. It's, you know, it's not a good night for that. Um, yeah. I mean, occasionally somebody would say like, like actually when I joined the band, they're like, but you know, you don't have to wear the jacket while you play. And I, for me, I actually prefer to be hot on stage than cold. So I, and I, I, maybe it comes from playing all those gigs out in the summer. In Texas. <laughs> New Hampshire winter. Well, no, in, in, in the summer in Texas versus like the, the winter in New England. Yeah, exactly. So I, like I kept my jacket on, you know, um, for most gigs, it was rare that I took my jacket off. Um, right. But if I did, I made a thing of it. Like I always had a a, a coat hanger on my drum, uh, on my mic stand. And so I could like take my jacket off and hang it on the mic stand and just like make a thing. It's, it can be a little part of the performance. Like, hang on, guys. You know, and I take off my coat and hang it and get back down. All right. Roll up my sleeves. It's like, all right, let's get get back to business. You know, that kind of thing. Um, but uh, but yeah, yeah, I knew it going in and it didn't. Like it didn't impact my desire to join the band in a negative way. Uh, yeah. it, it may, in fact, have impacted my desire to join in a positive way because it's like that's cool. These guys have their, you know, they've got a a, a look, and and that's going to help them get gigs. And yeah, like it, everybody looks the same. It frankly, it made things really easy because I just I didn't have to think about what should I wear for this gig. 
I knew I was going to wear my suit. Occasionally, like after maybe a year, I started yeah. mixing it up and I'd wear instead of a white shirt, maybe I'd wear a red shirt or, you know, whatever. But I but that was it. It was black suits, skinny black ties and and white shirts initially. And I was like, ah, I can I can, you know, I'll, let me see if I can get away with it at this gig. And it was like I showed up at the first gig with a red shirt. They're like, uh-uh. that's pretty no. cool. Uh, yeah, you know, no, it was take cool. it off. No, yeah, yeah, take oh, it off. that's yeah. good. No, they liked it. Yeah, it was, but it, it was a risk. You know, it was like, yeah, whatever. Yeah. So I, you know, I'll wrap this whole thing together and saying one of the hallmarks of successful musical organizations are the team's commitment to the team's success. Yeah. When I was just getting back into music, I just wanted to learn as much as I could about putting together a band, and I had an opportunity to talk with the manager of one of the more successful bands in this area. It was actually probably. As far as I can tell, the first tribute band, a band called Super Diamond. They were a Neil Diamond tribute. Okay. And uh, they are all in. Everybody in that band is all in, especially the guy who, who does the Neil Diamond part of it. And uh, the manager was telling me, he goes, you know, here's the deal. When you're putting together a band, all musicians like to think they are committed. But that that interpretation of what commitment really means and how far people are willing to be all in to be successful is where you're going to find the greatest disparity. The more you can find people that are going to be on the exact same page, the more successful you'll be almost regardless of musical proficiency. Oh yeah. No, you need like, it, it, and I would say no matter are you what, all in what type, well, or how all in are you right? Like you, it, like I think what you just said about commitment is really important because commitment means something different to each person and you need consistency on that in the, uh, in the same band. And it can be where, you know, the band's the most important thing. Forget our families, forget our, uh, you know, any other jobs we have, or it can fall somewhere else, you know, on that on that sure. spectrum. But it it like an inconsistency there among bandmates is a recipe for disaster. It's real. It's just a, it's just frustration. Right. Because. Some, somebody's going to be more committed than another and everyone's going to be aware of it. So like that, that's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Or that's a problem to solve. Yeah. All right. Good stuff. So we expect everybody's performance level to go up three notches this week. Uh, yeah, that's right. Um, there's two other things though, that I want to add that, that I had on our, on our list. Number one is, n- n- uh, or number whatever to the, the, the additions here, the encores, uh, Know how to communicate with your band on stage, like have a conversation about, all right, look, if something's going wrong or if I, you know, if there's, especially if there's a, a, a defined leader, which there probably should be on stage, even if you don't have a leader the rest of the time, you know, what's the signal to end a song? What's the signal to go around one more time? Like, like have that explicitly communicated amongst you. It will, it will relieve a lot of stress when you get into a scenario where things aren't quite what they need to be, either because maybe, you know, people are up and dancing and you want to go longer or something has gone wrong and you need to end the song or whatever, like have those signal signals and don't guess at them. Talk about it. It can take, it'll take 30 seconds at most and you're good to go. So that that's one. And then the other is, and so many people don't stop to do this when you get to a club or whatever venue you're playing, and you plug your, you know, you plug your instrument in or you set up your drums or whatever, and you start hitting things and, you know, or playing things and like getting it all together, making sure your stuff works. Listen to how your instruments sound in the room. It like every room's different and every room is going to require something different out of you to make your band as a whole, but also individually as instrumentalists sound good. And just yep. being, just being aware of that fact is going to set you above, I would say, 80% of the people that are out there that, that think, oh, yeah, well, uh, you know, my my uh, snare drum tone or my guitar tone that sounds good in the tiny little 10 by 10 practice room, mm. uh, you know, that's perfectly padded or not perfectly padded, like whatever, is the same as it needs in a, you know, a club that's, you know, 100 by 40 and a wooden floor and a tin roof. You, you know, it's just like there's no way you, conversation sounds different in a, in those two rooms your instruments, which are amplified at levels way beyond conversation, are going to sound way different in those two rooms. So just think about that. Just Definitely. think about it. Yeah. 
So. Hey, Dave, don't we have a sponsor this week? We do. I'm glad you brought that up. It's Tune Licensing at TuneLicensing.com. These folks, they've been sponsoring us for the last eight weeks, and it has been stellar. They are a great service that takes the difficulty involved in getting licensing for cover songs that you want to release, they take all those headaches away, right? So you're a band, you want to put out a CD or some stuff that you want to sell, and you want to represent how your band sounds playing the songs that you play, but you're a cover band. And so you need to have, um, you know, the, the, the rights to be able to sell those things and distribute them so that somebody doesn't come and tell you to stop, right? If you're doing this as, you know, perhaps a way of generating a little extra cash and maybe getting some promotion happening all at the same time, the last thing you want is to put all the effort in, record the songs, you know, release them, produce them, whatever it is. And then boom, somebody says, oh, no, no, you don't have the rights <laughs> because the reality is you can get the rights. Anything that's been released by someone else, presumably the people that have the rights to do so initially Anything that's been released, you also can release. You just have to make sure you do it the right way and that you pay them the right licensing fee. Tune licensing takes the headache away. As long as you know that you need to do that, they take it from there. So you go to tunelicensing.com, you pick the song that you're going to do, you pick how you're going to, you know, distribute it and all that stuff. And then, you know, they calculate what the licensing fee is going to be. They take care of all the headaches of getting that license for you. And uh, and that's that. You can save 15% using coupon code GIGGAB2018 to, uh, to uh, check out there at TuneLicensing.com. Again, 15% off using GIGGAB2018 at checkout at TuneLicensing.com. Our huge thanks to Tune Licensing for not only sponsoring this episode, but, but sponsoring the last eight, you guys got to check this out. Please do it. Um, even if you're not ready to release right now, just go check out what they've done so that you have it in your head and you know what to do going forward. So our thanks to tune licensing for absolutely. For yeah. And you're doing the right thing. You're making sure that the music that you want to put out there, the people who created it are going to get their fair share. Yeah. That's how it works. That's how it works. Yeah. Cool. Dave, you got any other tips for us, Paul, while we're here? I will, but I think we're good for today. But I okay. think it's, you know, this is a topic we should just keep coming back to and coming back to because it's really helpful. And I think the most useful thing is, is develop that, um, develop that mirror. If you, you know, look inside yourself and, you know, figure out who you are when you're on stage, watch yourself. Those videos are incredibly helpful and, you know, figure out what works for other people. Keep trying, keep trying different things, talk to other people, get good advice from people you trust. But the good thing is you get better at this the more that you do it and um, just come up with your own list of do's and don'ts. You know, the ones that work for me or what might work for Dave might be a different list for you. But uh, what we gave you here should be a good place for you to get started. It's true because you'll have your own natural, uh, to, you know, to, to the point that you, you constantly bring up, Paul, which in a good way is, is a good thing is is you have your own truth. Right. So. You start with that and then you just got to kind of tweak that a little bit because, you know, uh, there's some things that don't necessarily you might be missing or some things you do that you don't necessarily need to translate on stage every time. And yep. and just being aware. I really think that's the key, man, is just being aware of of how you come across. Now, it's it's impossible even even when I say, you know, I wait five days to, you know, go watch Madhouse performances or, or any performance before I really am willing to do it. To, it. It's not always five days, by the way. The last Mad, the the the, the one that we did in, uh, in what's this, April? The one we did in March. I still haven't watched any of that stuff because it was it yeah. felt to me like a train wreck the whole <laughs> way through. It wasn't. People enjoyed the heck out of themselves, but I'm I'm not ready to relive any of those moments. Um, yeah, but, but, you know, like when I am, there will be things to learn from them. Uh, you, you know, just like th there always is. And, and you gotta be ready to learn and willing to learn. And I mean, that's the key. That's you gotta, you gotta want to be a good performer. Yeah. Yeah. Just like you want to be a good guitar player, or you want to be a good singer or drummer or whatever it is. There's another, there's a whole other thing that you, that you're doing. And that is you are being a performing musician, so you have to want to do that too. 
And then, you know, you'll find the ways to get better at it, but treat it like anything else. It's not going to come naturally to most people just like sitting down at a drum set. Most people aren't going to be able to play, you know, like, like a, you know, a Neil Peart drum part, right. All the way through. You're not going to play La Via Strangiato the first time you sit down at a drum set, or maybe Mm -hmm. even the last time you sit down at a drum set, but, (laughs) uh, (laughs) right. You know, but it's the same with performing. You can get better. You can get closer and closer to that goal that, that you want to hit. So just treat it like another part of what you do. Yeah. Yeah. Cool, man. All right. Well, that's what we got here. Let me, uh, let me find the band and see if we can bring them in. There they are. Count it off. That's it. Thanks, folks. Thanks to Always be performing. Always be performing. Visit us on Facebook, giggappodcast.com, and then giggappodcast.com slash Facebook. You can see us there. Have a good week, Paul. Later, Dave. See y'all.